So this month Doom turned 30 years old, and last month Half-Life turned 25 years old. Somebody should really make a documentary about that. And I'm not just pointing that out to remind my fellow 90s gamers that we're halfway to our inevitable deaths, or to pull the nostalgic heartstrings and remember the good old days. No, as it turns out, looking at the past 30 years of evolution for the first person genre can give you a little bit of an idea of where things might be going. So today on By Design, we're going to aim the barrel squarely at the genre of first person shooters. How we got here, the current state of things, and what we should brace for next. To really chew into all of this, I called up a murderer's row of first person experts, from veteran designer and Valorant co-creator Stephen Lim, to New Blood Interactive's Dave Oshray, and of course no conversation about FPS would be complete without the godfather of the genre himself, John Alfonso Romero. Today, with the help of these folks, we're going to try and look at FPS games in a way that you're probably not used to, because first-person shooters, while among the most beloved of video game genres, are also one of the most misunderstood. So whether you're a fan of classic 90s shooters, extraction shooters, arena shooters, first-person RPGs, immersive sims, mill sims, or walking sims, perhaps you'll get a better understanding of why it is you like the FPS games you do. And spoilers, it has almost nothing to do with guns. So, as is quickly becoming tradition on this show, let's break it all down into three separate sections. Firstly, let's talk about 90s shooters and how they're having a bit of a comeback. Then we can talk about how there actually is no first-person shooter genre at all. And third, what we can expect from shooter games in 2024 and beyond. Let's jump in. For kids like me who grew up in the 90s, the rate of change in video games was breakneck by today's standards. A game that came out in 1991 looked like sweaty garbage by the time 1992 rolled around. Entire genres came and went in the span of years. This was down to a few things, but the main one was technology. As computers got faster and cheaper to produce, the resources that programmers had at their disposal grew exponentially. So many of the most important games of this era were led by teams with expert programmers. But this increase in technology also meant that programmers programs could have more graphics and sounds, so the sizes of these teams expanded to fill out a roster of creative positions. Okay, how about we drag in some of these guests of ours? First up is Dave Oshray, founder of New Blood Interactive, who were responsible for making games like Dusk, A Medieval, Ultra Kill, and Gloomwood. First-person games that are new, but have a distinctive 90s feel. And after Dave, a man who should need no introduction. The father of the FPS, id Software co-founder, adopted Irishman, and one of the nicest guys in the games industry you're ever likely to meet, John Romero. After Wolf, it was Doom. After Doom, it was Duke. After uh, Duke, it was Thief. After Thief, it was Fallout. And the, the rest, is, then that's how, I, that's how I was raised. You know, in the 90s, you know, we didn't have the internet to tell us what was coming out and what was good. You got what you got. So like, I didn't play Deus Ex for like years after. I never played System Shock. I never even heard of System Shock, you know? It's like, you got what you got. There was no Steam reviews or Twitter to tell you what games were coming out or what was good or what the top 10 shooters coming out this year are. It was really, I, I honestly feel really blessed to have grown up in the 90s and not with Skibbity Toilet or whatever the fuck it's then. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just love where the FPS has gone because when it started, it was basically our games. And in, and then we started to splinter into different areas like tactical shooters, you know, military sims, hero shooters, uh, Destiny style stuff. It, it's huge, you know, and now, you know, since the last, I don't know, five years or so, retro shooters. And so these retro games are trying to, to be like 90s shooters you know, using modern tech and, and everything. And, uh, and there's, they're just great. You know, it's really cool to see um, so many people who had a great, you know, memory of playing games back then and want to create their own their own memory of a game that, that has that aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, well, so I just got done reading Romero's book, uh, Doom Guy, which was a great read, by the way, and just, Without Carmack, where would we be? He was literally creating, you know, new technologies and solving problems like every day for years in the 90s. And then everybody else was just trying to catch up. You know, we didn't know it. 
we just appreciated it. It wasn't like, you know, again, there was no digital foundry back then to tell us like, oh, look, look, look at these, you know, this ray tracing, look at the performance difference. Like, we, we just thought things looked cool. You know, when Unreal came out and that castle flyby, that was like, I was, video games will never look better than this ever. I also recently read John's memoir, Doom Guy, Life in First Person, which goes into fantastic detail about this era. If you want to learn about the technology and design origins of the FPS, there is perhaps no better tome. So I'm not going to retell the history of FPS games, but from Wolf we got Doom, and suddenly there were more of these. The build engine sprite-based shooters like Rise of the Triad and Duke Nukem 3D, Bungie's Marathon, Parallax Software's Descent, Star Wars Dark Forces. When Quake came along and we were fully embracing 3D rendering, everything exploded. System Shock 2, Hexen, Unreal, Blood, Thief, even the consoles were getting involved with GoldenEye and Mario 64 forever changing their respective genres. There is a glorious design simplicity to these 90s games. It's where a lot of the fundamental questions were answered, and so it should be unsurprising that developers still mine it for ideas today. But what is interesting is how in the past five years there has been such a dramatic shift to using not just the design lessons of this genre, but the particular look and feel of these games too. This 30 year back aesthetic is is not just confined to shooters it's also like in horror games people want that ps1 aesthetic you know that the super pixely shimmering textures and jerky animation and it's perfect for horror games but indies are really leading the charge in all of this stuff you know they're they're they, they have the time and they got the dedication and they, you know, they have the technology now. The design of Doom and Quake and Duke and all those games were rock solid then, and it's rock solid now. And if you apply the same lessons, if you read Romero's book, you know he's been you know he's been going over the same lessons for years and years about how to design a space and think about a space and loops and set pieces and introducing new things to the player. People like indies making games that are hyperspeed, like Turbo Overkill and, and Ultra Kill being super fast games and uh and just you know they're trying to capture that that the the magic essence of what makes a really great 90s game yeah it's just there's just so much going on that and i really love the variety you know there's a lot of really great variety um so with our games we take the what we've tried to do is like not only you know take the best lessons from these classic games but also the things that we like the best and blend genres it's not just about let's make a game like doom it's like what are the things that doom did really well that we really like what are the things that quake did well that we really like look at the interactivity that started to happen in games like duke and half-life you know look at the stealth that happens in thief you know what if we combine that with a game like Resident Evil where it's more of a survival horror. Not just pulling things from our childhood for the sake of nostalgia, we're pulling things from our childhood because they were great and they were fun and we miss them and the design is still really, really good. Even even at it, it was different because it was such a small team. We only had 10 people on Quake, you know? And on, on Doom, we had five people for most of it. So, you know, like I do a lot of game jams. In fact, the game that, that, that I'm making during the day came from a game jam. There's lots of there's so much so many ways that you can make a game that fulfill a lot of different creative urges that people might have. By the time Half-Life had come out in 1998, we'd gone from ray-traced Nazi mazes to fully 3D online shooters in just under six years. Fortnite came out six years ago. Most teenagers who grow up playing FPS games today have no idea how fast this genre can change. The late 90s saw the dawn of the GPU and even more power to render realistic worlds. On top of that, the market now had expectations. Players had been playing FPS games for almost a decade now. They knew what they liked and disliked, or at least they thought they did. And so the genre expanded to fill these ever-growing needs. Games like Far Cry existed in large sandbox-style maps. Stalker's maps were even larger and gameplay had deep role-playing mechanics that rewarded players that could get over its rough edges. Half-Life 2 would forever set the benchmark for linear first-person games, while titles like No One Lives Forever, Soldier of Fortune, Red Faction and even Postal 2 would gather their own fans. Those marathon guys made three great new games in here too, while titles like Portal swapped out the shooting to create a puzzle-focused experience. 
perhaps a prelude to the walking simulator side genre that would emerge soon after. Dungeon crawlers were back on the menu too. The Elder Scrolls series, which had continued to carry the first-person fantasy baton, released Morrowind in 2002, followed by the juggernaut Oblivion in 2006. Back then we called these first-person RPGs, and suddenly everyone was playing games with swords, elves, and cats trying to sell you drugs. Similarly, Bioshock appealed to a wider audience by streamlining the immersive sim, a genre that to this day creates some of the best games most people will never play. You may also remember that around this era, a lot of the shooters we were playing weren't first person at all, they were third person. Games like Operation Winback and Kill Switch had introduced a new taking cover mechanic that suddenly allowed improved third person shooting. But it was when Gears of War came out that everything started to shift. Suddenly there were third person shooters all over the place. Not that FPS fans actually minded, they were happy to play these too. We'll get more into explaining why that's the case later. But back in the land of guns, a massive evolution occurred this decade. Medal of Honor turned into Call of Duty and then into Modern Warfare, a game that took the foundational elements of online shooting and applied RPG-style progression to the equation, creating an online shooter that tracked your progress and rewarded you the more you played. You know, the closest thing we got to a retro shooter was Bulletstorm. You know, we were, in, we were knee deep in the Call of Duty, carrying two weapons, hide behind things to breathe, you know, days of shooters. It was, it was dark out there. And looking back, perhaps this was the genre's Prometheus moment. The 2010s had some landmark FPS games like Doom 2016 and Titanfall 2, and the continued expansion into open world games like Far Cry and Skyrim, and the re-emergence of the immersive sim thanks largely to Arcane Studios. Most of the big money was in online shooters that you could play over and over again. We now live in a world where annual Call of Duty games are mostly sold on their multiplayer access. The biggest FPS games in the world were online shooters with seasons designed to bring players back in again and again. PUBG's foundations were at least organic, emerging from the tight mod scene like many of the best shooters of the 90s, but the battle royale genre was then applied to other first-person games that saw potential market growth. Yeah, I mean, since then, what the battle royale came out, which just like the gold rush happening at that point. You know, uh, Overwatch is now in its you know second iteration, you know, Overwatch 2 now. Similarly, studios like Bungie, who had built their reputation making deep single-player games with fun multiplayer modes in their own right, went all in on the emerging live services game in a way that was difficult for fans not to get cynical about. Almost a decade after the release of Destiny 1, I think a lot of the negativity that the audience has today was planted in that initial cynicism ultimately being proven correct. Yeah, it's all multiplayer live service bullshit, isn't it? It's all see games with seasons. I don't want seasons. I want to start a game and I play it and then I finish the game. Like, oh, that was pretty good. The credits roll. Now there's no credits anymore. The games just go forever. Season one, season two. We've we've brought back the... Re Fortnite has gone on so long that like they've brought back original Fortnite. I resonate with a lot of what Dave says to me. I have limited patience for games designed to get you to play for weeks, months, or years. But then, given the economics of 2010 shooters, I kind of get it. There was a lot of FPS games back in the 2010s, and many of them did not do well. And it was during that time that online multiplayer games had broken into the mainstream. You could argue that much of the next 10 years of online was based on these market conditions. Not new technology or design innovation, but on economics. And while I love the games that New Blood creates, Dave will be the first first one to tell you, they don't sell as much as what people think. Maybe that's okay for a small team like theirs, but in the world of mainstream first-person shooters, a lot of players choose multiplayer games over single-player campaigns. Right now, this market will always choose Apex Legends over Titanfall 3. So why is all of this ancient history important? Well, it's because as foundational as those 90s shooters were, the categorization of games into these first-person shooter buckets is basically redundant at this stage. And not just because the FPS genre has expanded and grown over the past three decades into all of these different types of experiences, but because in 2023, when you're designing games, genres themselves are kind of not important anymore. 
me introduce you to Stephen Lim, or Slim as his friends call him. Slim currently works at Raid Base on an as yet unannounced game that is not a first person shooter but his previous game was. Steven was one of the original creators of Valorant at Riot, and prior to working there, he had stints at Blizzard working on Project Titan, which eventually turned into Overwatch, and before that he worked on Splinter Cell Blacklist, Gears of War Judgment, Spore, and Resistance Fall of Man, among others. Slim has worked in a bunch of genres, but his passion is in competitive games, be that MOBAs like League or his current addiction, Escape from Tarkov. And his perspective is that FPS fans are not necessarily fans of a first-person perspective or shooting at all. I never thought about it like working in specific genres. I, I guess something that's a little that could be a little bit different is I and people like me have thought about our audiences by motivation, core motivation, and um, that frees us to not be beholden to certain manifestations that are classic. So let's say shooters in general. Is there a shooter audience? I would argue not these days because I think people engage with shooters in very different ways. There are people playing shooters very casually and just want to come in and frag for like 15 minutes or an hour or whatever. There are people who are like hunting people. <laughs> There's a very different itch is being scratched across different games, even if the action and the mechanic is similar. There was a year, I think around, I don't know, 2016 or something, um, our data team at Riot came up to me and asked like, the people who churn out of league they go to counter-strike they're like is there an overlap between mobas and shooters and i'm like guys just take a step back and look at there's if you want to play a competitive 5v5 game there's only two games <laughs> so think of it that way you know Steve's argument is that while genre is important for some categorization, it doesn't really distinguish between why players play one game or another. And in fact, it's other elements like a game's pace, its look, uh, the fact that you can play it competitively, the fact that it has a story. These things are much more powerful hooks when it comes to attracting new players. And while some genres are fairly consistent when it comes to these flavors, over the past 30 years, the FPS has broadened in so many different directions that the genre of first-person shooter is redundant by today's standards. No more clearly is this seen than in games like Call of Duty, which ship single-player and several multiplayer components that often have very little crossover with players. I think of the mechanics of a game as like the tool set or the language versus like my personality type is like lends itself to certain subsets of games that might cross span or span different genres but the language my tool set my palette might be like i like shooting or i don't like shooting so i think the mentality of a multiplayer gamer it has a different set of expectations from a development standpoint there's a lot of overlap because there's still a lot of assets to make performance a lot of similar issues but i think from a player perspective i think you want different things out of each one so that's the cool thing about shooters now, they can go in so many directions. You can get a game like Robocop, you can get a game like Ultra Kill, um, and for everybody else, I guess you can play Modern Warfare 3. Not to be confused with Modern Warfare 3. Now, shooters are one of the most well-funded, beat-up, um, labeled genres that there have been. And so when we started doing it, people were like, why would you make a shooter in you know, 2010 or whatever? And you're going to go up against like Call of Duty and blah, blah, and Battlefield and everything. And, Okay, guys, like the opportunity isn't to make another shooter. The opportunity is if you want a competitive game, there's just League of Legends. Because at the time, StarCraft was like subsiding. But imagine a competitive game with the, like, the League of Legends treatment, um, global service, one competitive scene globally, not even to mention the esports infrastructure and all that stuff. Like, And so I saw Green Pastures because of thinking of it that way versus like, oh, I want to make a shooter. And there's like a thousand. So what does all this mean for the future of the FPS genre? What can we say about the evolution of a category of games that appeals to people who like playing online competitively, online co-op with their friends, uh, walking simulators, story games, military sims, immersive sims? How can we possibly distinguish or think of what is coming down the road when it's all so fractured? I think the canary in the coal mine for AAA single-person FPS games is going to be Stalker 2. Not only is there a deep respect and nostalgia for this series, but games like Tarkov, while competitive, show that there is a desire for this flavor of technical, hardcore, open-world experience. 
Similarly, single-player RPG fans have Clockwork Revolution to look forward to. If either of these games breaks big like Baldur's Gate 3 did, we may see renewed interest in the genre from publishers and developers. I think the biggest unknown exists in the online FPS space. In the more competitive wing, it seems like Overwatch 2 and Valorant are beyond their peaks, and while Fortnite appears to still be huge, the fact that they're embracing driving games may be an early indication of plateauing growth. As Destiny 2 approaches its final shape, much of the audience for that game seems to be losing interest in live services entirely. Some of last year's games certainly paint the picture that multiplayer is struggling a bit. Payday 3 seemed to die on release, and as much as I've loved it, Counter-Strike 2 isn't exactly setting the world on fire. But do you know what did? An indie online shooter which aped the Battlefield games of old. Battlebit Remastered is over 100,000 reviews on Steam, and players seem very happy with it while the same people who made those classic Battlefield games just put out The Finals, a free-to-play 3v3v3 competitive shooter which I found to be a breath of fresh air. Okay, on to the indies. So this is where things get interesting because while we have games like Angerfoot, Unrecord and Gloomwood to look forward to, each a totally different flavor of first-person experiences, it's the unknown games of this genre that leave me the most excited. And Dave does a great job of explaining why. You know, with the indie scene, we know where it's going. Um, you know, it's, it's, everything goes in cycles. So, you know, like now that we've looped around to Doom and Quake stuff, now we're getting into the immersive Sims. People keep saying, oh, when are we going to get the half like lights? You know, and, you know, when are we get, it's, it is 100% on the indie scene going to loop back around to indie versions of Halo and Call of Duty 1 and 2, without a doubt. You know, the same way that we looped back around to pixel art and then N64 style graphics. And now we're in that PS1 era horror boom. And then we're getting into PS2 style stuff with texture warping and stuff like that. Everything comes back around. Um, and it's not because of nostalgia. It's because the people who are growing up, this is what they grew up with. So it's about time we answered the last and most important question. What's next for these games? The FPS genre, if it even exists anymore. I'm sure some new blockbuster online game will take a lot of our attention, and I hope we're going to get a bunch of exciting indie games attempting to ape the design of Half-Life, but the truth is that the thing about these types of games that has captured the attention of so many players was that we didn't know what was around the corner. The thing that this has reminded me of, looking back and playing all these old games and talking to all these developers, is that the first person shooter genre was never exciting to me because it was about shooting or because it was in first person. It was because it was constantly changing, really breaking down boundaries, creating entirely new subgenres all of the time. And while it's spread out now, it's a lot less defined, I don't think there's any reason why we should think that that evolution is going to slow down. Be that using new technologies before any other genre or evolving into dozens of new subgenres, hopefully the future of FPS games is something that most of us would never have even thought about. And just like those 90s kids, months or years from now will look back on videos like these and say, man, we really did not know what was coming. And until then, well, thanks to the folks at id Software, there's over 30 years of fantastic first person games to enjoy. Love, absolutely love Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Such a, like, conquered that game many times over. Played Far Cry 6. I like the open world games, you know? Yeah, it's just, there's just so much going on that, and I really love the variety. You know, there's a lot of really great variety. Mm -hmm.